in the booth. We're good, Mayor. Great. Well, thank you for uh, um, setting this up for us, uh, but Gary and uh, Derek for the uh, IT. We are still in a virtual world uh, having um, these uh, council meetings uh, in accordance with the governor's uh, executive order. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, town council meeting. This is the council meeting for Monday, March 1st, and uh, it is a workshop meeting. This, uh, as I said, is being recorded right now, as well as being live streamed uh, on YouTube. Um, with that said, Deputy Mayor Mazzarella, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> sure. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, Sue, if you could uh, call the roll, please. Hey, Councillor Biggs? Present. Councillor Flanagan? Here. Councillor Forrest? Present. Councillor Hill? Here. Councillor O'Connor? Here. Councillor Pelletier? Here. Councillor Pentelo? Here. Deputy Mayor Mazzarella? Here. Mayor Rell? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate that. Uh, as we talked uh, briefly before, we do have a presentation tonight. Um, and is it uh, Gabriella or Gabrielle Frijan? Is that how to pronounce it? Um, it you can. Um, the preference actually is Freegon. Freegon. Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, you're with the DEEP That's and right. um, waste recycling and I guess all things uh, renewable. Uh, so we appreciate you coming in uh, tonight to talk to us about um, you know some options that I know uh, CCM, both the CCM and COST, Connecticut Conference of Municipalities and Connecticut uh, Council of Small Towns have been working towards, um, you know, more into the recycling stream, not only with, um, you know, single stream recycling, but also with um, biodegradables and uh, you know, compostable materials and getting those out of our waste stream and um, you know utilizing the services of uh, you know composting and um, you know recycling them for you know yard use and, and commercial use. Um, if you would uh, you know talk about some of the um, work that DEEP is doing. I know this is a uh, one of the priorities of Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, Katie Dykes, and uh, I know you're working with a number of municipalities. As I said, CCM has put this on their agenda as one of the, the priorities. And uh, I, I think uh, the first selectman, Laura uh, Francis from Durham, has been spearheading this effort and has been reaching out to a number of municipalities, including Weathersfield, um, to see what we can do with our compostable um, recyclables to keep them out of the, the um, garbage and, uh, you know, hopefully lessen the um, tipping fees and, and weight that goes into our, um, into the garbage. And then ultimately for us, it goes to uh, South Meadows where the Mira plant is for mm -hmm. um, energy, you know, trash energy um, facility. So um, without further ado, I will, you know, open the floor up to you and and kind of give us a, a an overview of what the state is is looking at, and you know how municipalities may be able to uh, work uh, collectively with the state. Great. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a, a presentation that I'm probably going to be running through quite quickly, um, but uh, I can make it available to you uh, after the meeting for reference. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, um, first, I, I'd like to thank you for inviting me uh, to your council meeting so that I can give you an overview of the efforts that um, with many municipalities, um, the department made over the course of the last third of 2020 uh, and a little bit into 2021. Um, as you know, well, let me introduce myself. My name is Gabrielle Fregon. Uh, I've been with the Department of Environmental Protection since uh, 1990 uh, and with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection when it became that in 2011. Um, I've worked in a number of different divisions um, and um, I am currently the Assistant Director for the Waste Engineering and Enforcement Division uh, in which division um, is both the Sustainable Materials Management Program as well as Solid Waste Permitting. So uh, what Katie, uh, along with the chief elected officials of many municipalities in Connecticut um, initiated was um, a, this coalition, the Connecticut Coalition for Sustainable Materials Management um, with uh, with goals and commitments um, with respect to the end products of that effort. Um, there were approximately 70 municipalities that signed on right up front. And I think we've uh, increased that number to about 80. Um, but as you can see, our, um, our objectives were varied um, and, but they began with uh, an understanding that we wanted to collectively discuss past experiences and challenges, uh, but also successes uh, with respect to waste management um, issues uh, for each of the municipalities that were um, engaged in this effort. What we did was we engaged with not only the municipalities, but with recyclers, with the waste management service providers, um, with the regional waste authorities, and the haulers. And so what we did was we went out for public uh, uh, response uh, before we even began um, the meetings in earnest. And we surveyed everyone. What are your objectives? What are your uh, principal uh, concerns? Uh, what would you like to see done? Um, but more than that, we also wanted to try to find ways where we could fund um, these initiatives uh, um, and the goal in, and furthering the goals of the comprehensive materials management strategy, which is the statewide solid waste management plan. So we wanted to develop a menu of options uh, and then we wanted to share that with all of the municipalities so that the municipalities had an opportunity to take a look at all of the options that were, um, that were discussed uh, deemed worthy of inclusion by the municipalities in the working groups, and then um, laid laid out uh, for each of the municipalities to take a look at, evaluate, and hopefully implement more than uh, one, uh, many more than one, hopefully. Um, so those were our commitments and our goals. And what we did was um, outline for each of the objectives um, you know, how are we going to achieve that? So obviously uh, sharing the experiences was the actual um, uh, coalition meetings. And um, as a result of the survey, um, what we ended up with was a, a sort of a snapshot of what people thought was important. Um, organics, food scraps were clearly um, very important. The majority of municipalities said that they were the most important, um, but extended producer responsibility and recycling were also important. And you'll see that smart, smart pricing uh, or unit-based pricing was also in the top five. Um, so we spoke with experts in their fields, um, but this survey dictated or at least guided us in terms of establishing the working groups that we did establish. 
um, three was the funding and we wanted to look for ways to um, provide that financial support for municipalities um, through grants um, and other creative means. Uh, the fourth objective was the development of the menu of options. And this is just the, the snapshot of the front page or a portion of the front page, but everything can be found regarding the CCSMM work products, as well as the actual meetings. Um, we have links to those meetings on our webpage uh, for dedicated to CCSMM. Uh, and finally, commitments. We wanted municipalities to um, take that leap um, and uh, implement programs that were maybe not necessarily 100% comfortable for them to make, um, but that would clearly give them um, an advantage uh, you know, over the next decade or two decades or more uh, with respect to preserving, um, uh, pre preserving your budget to the best extent possible, to the greatest extent possible, um, minimizing to the greatest extent possible the costs associated with waste management um, actions. So as you know, I mean, it's not a secret that Mira has said that they will likely be shutting the plant down on or before uh, June 30th of 2022. Uh, and that was clearly a precipitating uh, announcement uh, that, that made it very clear to everyone we were facing a waste crisis. And that crisis is a disposal crisis. We don't have a crisis with respect to generating it. We have a, an issue that's looming uh, very rapidly coming closer to us about where should the material go for responsible and appropriate disposal. Well, Mira's suggestion was landfilling. Um, and as you can see from this chart, uh, the yellow or orange line here uh, represents just in New York State, the capacity for landfill uh, availability um, going forward in time through to 2050, out, all the way out, out at the end of the, at the end of the, um, chart. Uh, but then the blue line represents New England. So that's regional capacity. And you'll see that, I mean, it gets pretty close to zero um, the further out you go. Uh, and so this obviously creates um, an additional uh, um, urgency to the discussions regarding how can we best manage waste that we generate, that our residents generate in the state of Connecticut. But what's important to note is that municipalities budgets are vulnerable in light of this chart. Uh, your, your budgets are vulnerable because there's going to be increasing demand for whatever capacity there is. Um, and demand drives pricing. Uh, and so a, a landfill to the west of us um, is going to have its pick of customers uh, and, that, uh, and that will drive prices up. There's no guarantee that uh, landfills that are out of state will continue to be amenable to receiving Connecticut waste. Um, and always keep in mind that your liability follows your waste. So if it goes to a, a landfill that's an out of state landfill and that landfill, since the state doesn't oversee it, at this state doesn't oversee it, um, we don't know how motivated the owner of that landfill is to, to ensuring compliance. So if they have an adverse event, um, the, towns, the town or towns that sent that waste over to that landfill that where we had an adverse event, um, their liability lies with that landfill. I just realized I covered up my button. <laughs> Sorry. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is uh, talk about implementing different programs. And uh, the first one that I want to talk about, which is 
um, probably the most effective program is a unit-based pricing program or a pay-as-you-throw. Um, so when we when we were going through the the um, the actual uh, process of the CCSMM, excuse me. Um, one of the things that came across very loud and clear was that municipalities want someone uh, to establish a mandate um, because of the concerns regarding um, political fallout, um, popularity, uh, the naysayers, uh, you know, getting, um, getting excited about it. And um, we've seen a lot of stuff uh, a lot of not great stuff happen through social media um, surrounding pay as you throw or smart or unit based pricing. Um, but municipalities expressed an interest in implementing it on a, as a regional approach. And what can it do? Well, what it can do is immediately uh, decrease the volume of MSW that is bound for disposal by 44 um, percent, and that's an immediate response uh, uh, to implementing unit-based pricing, and it's um, and it's maintained. But but where does it go? That's the question that people ask. Where does the waste go? If you're going to reduce it by 44 percent, where what happens to the rest of it? Well, what happens to the rest of it is um, you get an increase in the recycling you get an increase in or a decrease in um, the generation itself. So right away, you're, you're, because you're signaling to the consumer, to the resident of your town, that it costs money to throw something away, they will start source reducing. So they won't generate as much. So you get a drop in generation, you get an increase in the diversion of recyclables rather than throwing something in the trash because you just don't, you don't want to be bothered washing it out. You actually take the time to wash it out and put it in the recycling bin because that won't cost you, but throwing it in the trash will. So I, um, this afternoon, I, uh, I quickly asked my staff to, um, to give us a snapshot for Weathersfield. So this is just for Weathersfield. Um, and these are the tons that were disposed, MSW tons disposed in 2017, 2018, and 2019. And these numbers were derived through the reporting um, that is required. So uh, you'll see that, um, so let's just take for calendar year 2019, what was generated was on the order of 16,000 tons in that year. Um, well, with the implementation of unit-based pricing with a 44% reduction, you would be uh, generating 10,000, approximately 10,500, 10,600 of tons for disposal. Now multiply, multiply that by the tipping fee uh, and you'll mul multiply both of them by the tipping fee and subtract and you'll see what your, your savings could be. So let's just say uh, the new contract pricing uh, I found out today uh, for a tier one long-term commitment with Mira is $105 per ton. Um, at $105 per ton, the 16,000 tons uh, would cost you almost $1.7 million for disposal. Um, a a an implementation of unit-based pricing resulting in a 44% reduction of MSW for disposal uh, would result in a $1.1 million uh, bill for disposing of MSW, leaving you with a differential savings of close to $580,000. And that's, that's just assuming that the rate of generation stayed the same through um, this coming uh, um, state fiscal year. So what does that tell you? It, it tells you that unit-based pricing is 
the first step to increasing diversion and lowering the costs for every municipality uh, and, and uh, across the state and for uh, extending the capacity that we do have in state, um, you know, just spreading it out a little bit more and making those facilities last a little longer. Um, so I'm good. There's a, a number of slides I'm just going to gloss through. Um, so here, here are what the CCM um, member towns responded in terms of um, what they'd be interested in pursuing for, for unit-based pricing. Um, and you'll see the one that stands way out is form regional coalitions for implementing um, unit-based pricing uh, initiatives. So how does it work? What it, what it does is it basically uh, tells the resident uh, how much waste they're generating because they have to pay for whatever it is they generate for disposal. But, you know, traditionally um, you pay through your property taxes uh, or it's subscription. And subscription is not a good motivator. Um, the way that the costs of barrels um, uh, is usually structured is what I like to call um, the movie theater soda. So, well, for 25 more cents, you can get a, an extra large. Uh, and so people will generally say, okay, fine, then I'll get a 95 gallon tote. Well, once they get a 95 gallon tote, what do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna make the most of that tote. They're going to fill it every week. And what do they fill it with? whatever they want, uh, including recyclables, including yard waste, including a whole host of materials that really shouldn't be going into the, the MSW system it, that should be diverted or managed differently. So if you're going to implement a unit-based pricing uh, system, you wanna make it so that the cost of the container is commensurate with the volume so that it tracks linearly so a 20 gallon tote would be half the price of a 40 gallon tote, which would be you know, two thirds of the price of a 60 gallon tote. So you wanna make it linear because that price signal is what drives the consumer or the resident to change what they're doing uh, in terms of throwing things away. And this is just obviously a, a, a cute little depiction to, to uh, to illustrate. So um, moving on to the other uh, uh, working groups, we had an extended producer responsibility working group and we surveyed and you can see the results. Um, most of the municipalities said household hazardous waste was the problem, um, followed almost neck and neck by smoke detectors and batteries, um, but then also pharmaceuticals and sharps were on that list. So what, what's happening right now? Well, what's happening right now is gas cylinders and tires and smoke detectors. Those three materials, um, there's legislation being, uh, being proposed currently for extended producer responsibility for those three waste streams. Um, one, because uh, tires, uh, illegal disposal of tires is a huge nuisance and a huge cost uh, to taxpayers because there is no uh, cost associated with um, just throwing it out the window or throwing it off the back of the, the truck. Um, but that responsibility then falls to the taxpayers. Um, gas cylinders, because they, they pose a, a, a danger to, um, to public health uh, because of the explosive uh, potential, both for waste haulers, if they have compaction trucks, if it's in the trash, um, or the waste facilities themselves, if uh, you know the materials are getting sorted, um, any any uh, any jostling, uh, jarring, hitting of the valve can create an explosion. Mira has uh, experienced, you know pretty bad explosions when they've discovered a 20 gallon tank um, in the refuse stream. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, and the other thing is just generic um, uh, EPR for, for packaging, which would address your single stream bucket completely. Um, so if we had EPR for packaging, um, then the recycling would not cost municipalities anything, not a thing. And if it were structured correctly, there would be profit sharing with the municipalities um, and the producers. So if, the, if and when the markets turn around uh, and plastics have value, paper have, has value, glass has value, uh, metal still have value, uh, et cetera, then um, it would still be zero cost uh, if, if it were neutral. Um, it's zero cost if it's in the negative, um, but it, there could be or it could be structured so that you would have some sort of profit sharing um, with, uh, with commodities of value. <clears throat> um, the next area was food scraps and organics, which honestly, pardon the pun, is low hanging fruit. This is something that any municipality can implement today. Um, and I noted, uh, I, I took a look um, before the meeting and Weathersfield has a registration under the municipal municipal transfer station general permit. And that general permit allows for the collection of food waste. Um, and the only thing that would have to happen is for Weathersfield to come up with a plan for how to collect. Um, Glastonbury has a 40 cubic yard vessel at the transfer station to collect their food scraps. Um, that's not something we would want to see, but we can certainly work with municipalities in terms of permitting. Um, if you have primarily a, a subscription uh, set up in your town, then you can work with the hauler and um, establish a separate bag collection system for organics, but have them both put into the MSW tote and then separate it because hopefully they're both in bags. Um, so the, the first three things that are in blue, um, the, the, the stakeholder conference, we held that last Friday. Uh, hopefully uh, you were able to attend uh, a part of it at least. Um, it was a, a, um, a meeting designed around establishing or developing infrastructure in the state, um, not just processing infrastructure, but also transfer infrastructure. Uh, so we, we talked about the opportunities for municipalities to collaborate and establish sort of a regional collection um, site for, for um, food scraps. We, we talked about streamlining permitting uh, for both municipalities and private entities that want to come into um, this area. Uh, and we also, um, through the survey that we conducted at the end of the um, at the end of the process, identified municipalities that were willing to host infrastructure for organics um, processing or diversion. So we, this was just these were two of the questions that we asked. Uh, how likely uh, is it that you would be interested in developing a residential food scrap collection? We had 18 of the, I think, 58 that responded say that they would be very interested to work collaboratively with another town to establish that kind of a collection um, infrastructure. And then this question uh, or this uh, question was what low or no cost program development would you be willing to undertake? Um, you'll see a number of them were already doing these things, which is which is things like um, the transfer station drop off for food, um, food donation, uh, schoolyard composting, which links to a great, uh, um, which can uh, assist in developing a great educational opportunity for me, for students to learn what it means to uh, be uh, sustainable. It, uh, in your daily choices. Um, this is what 
uh, it's a graphical representation of what some municipalities um, are currently doing. So you'll see the blue is already doing this uh, and the green is already doing this, whereas the red and the purple are what they would be interested in doing. And these are the, the topics right here on the, on the left. So um, things like reusable um, uh, containers for delivery uh, or takeout, um, purchasing products with recycled content, uh, ban expan banning expanded polystyrene for food service, uh, and, and et cetera. Um, and then for increasing recycling, that working group, um, that, that was geared towards uh, educating uh, and creating an understanding of where there are opportunities to, to reduce the, the generation of waste that can't be recycled, to reuse the materials that can be recycled or reused, and then increase the recycling of those materials um, that need to sort of be, be modified in order to have additional life. And what you'll see these three blue uh, bullets um, identify uh, current legislation that's in play. Uh, so there is legislation proposed for banning PFAS containing food service wear, um, a ban on single use plastics and expanded polystyrene, and also the right to repair um, concept is being uh, discussed. Um, and that may not quite fit into your, but I, into your idea of source, source reduction or increasing recycling, but it, it's really huge. It's uh, basically giving the consumer the right to have their equipment, vehicle, appliances, whatever, repaired and have access to the manuals um, to, to conduct those repairs and access to the parts that they need in order to conduct the repairs. So instead of having, uh, this is my own personal experience, instead of having a microwave that lasts all of three years and having to replace an entire microwave, um, if I had the ability to obtain the instruction manuals and purchase the parts, um, we could have repaired that microwave rather than having to just buy a brand new one. Um, but the reuse options are really easy and can happen almost immediately. Um, establishing swap shops, establishing textiles collection, um, require of your uh, commercial establishments the ability to uh, use reusable containers um, that residents bring in. And then recycling and diversion. Um, we, we talked about modernizing the bottle bill and that is actively uh, being, um, being discussed and, and addressed in the legislature uh, this session. And also recycled content standards so that if you increase the requirement for recycled material content, you're increasing the market for that material. So naturally that will drive um, diversion efforts. Um, and then there were, there were others, uh, other options, again, school programs on composting, recycling, zero waste, basically responsible, sustainable um, uh, lifestyles. Uh, you know, separating glass from the single stream um, and also a great concept, uh, which is if a municipality doesn't have a recycling coordinator, um, it makes it extremely difficult to implement and maintain these programs. Uh, so one of the concepts was sharing a recycling coordinator. So, uh, you know, you and a neighboring municipality could share um, a recycling coordinator um, that would actually end up giving you more bang for the buck because of, um, I can't think of the expression right now, um, you know, but you're getting more out of the same, uh, the same level of effort. So what did, what did they want? What did the municipalities that responded want from the department? primarily support, whether it was in terms of educational materials, outreach materials, or funding, it was support. Um, and that support could come through, uh, as I said, printed materials, outreach, 
um, anything like that, but also money. Uh, and we have grants. Um, there are grants. We um, Every year we work to replenish the grants uh, for municipalities in their uh, in implementing recycling, increasing recycling or diversion activities. Uh, but one thing that you can do is you can contact Sustainable CT and they have a grant program uh, and they will do, I think maybe recently there was one that was matching funding um, that may have been a different program though, but they have, um, they have money that they can share with municipalities uh, to establish these diversion programs um, and affect change in your municipality. Um, and then specifically the grants would go towards um, education, uh, supporting uh, organics diversion, uh, and then start up funds for special projects. Um, and then the other ones were sort of lower rated, but also uh, of interest to the, the municipalities that responded to the survey. Last three slides. So what are our next steps? Well, actually last two slides. So what are our next steps? Our next steps were to engage with your municipalities one-on-one, -on -one, but also to engage with the Product Stewardship Council um, the councils of government um, and the regional waste authorities and um, uh, I'm sorry, I just drew a blank. Um, we, we were, um, our next step, which we actually did last Tuesday was have a meeting with the regional waste authorities and the councils of government um, and sustainable CT uh, and regional waste authorities to talk through what are the options, uh, what, what pathways are there, and how can those entities support municipalities in implementing um, these types of programs, not only to be more sustainable, but also to, to benefit uh, in terms uh, of finance, financially being, um, being great programs to implement. Um, but keeping in mind that the, the best way to implement multiple programs and the, the one uh, um, program that signals the price is the driver of pricing is unit-based pricing, where you're paying for how much you have to throw out. Um, and then that creates diver additional diversion. It helps support extended producer responsibility programs. Um, it clearly um, will make changes to how people live um, that make them more responsible and sustainable in their daily lives. And there are some useful links um, for you. Um, the CCSMM website is, I think, almost up to date. We, we still have to post, um, I think, the organics infrastructure meeting uh, information from Friday. Um, but the comprehensive materials management strategy is the statewide solid waste management plan. A lot of that, uh, a lot of the work that we did is reflected in that from that document uh, is from 2016. And then, uh, you know, a bunch of other uh, resources for you. And that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Sorry, I'm, I was on mute. That's uh, okay. Very informative. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, you know, the, I've heard, and I'm sure mem many members of the council have heard some of these uh, initiatives um, before. And, um, you know, it, it's nice to see that uh, both sustainable CT, uh, the COGS, CCM, and COST are, um, you know, active participants in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we work with these folks as well, um, Gary. If you want to stop screen share or maybe oh, that's still on, Gabrielle. Oh, I'm sorry. Beautiful photo, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Great. it's from New Hampshire. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I was going to say Kent Falls, maybe uh, Farmington no. River. Sorry, different state. <laughs> um, we won't hold that against you. Uh, thank but. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> 
Uh, no, very informative. Um, you know, I, I have a couple questions, but I wanted to open it up to the floor if uh, if folks had anything for Gabrielle uh, on this presentation. I know it was a lot to take in, and you know, know. And this I'm is going on. That. You know, I'm trying to. I think many members on this council are are taking in information on you know recycling as well as um, you know unit based or um, you know yeah unit based pricing and you know everything. Um, any questions for Gabrielle? Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rowe. What's that? You're a little slow, Ryan. Yeah. Try it again. Is this better? A little is, lower, yeah. but we can we can hear you. Yeah. Timing's off. Okay. Got you. All right. I was just asking. Um, is there so a few years back there was an initiative where um, residents, if they recycled, they would there was incentives and based on how much they recycled and how many pounds or whatnot. Um, there's a program where they were able to turn in the amount that they recycled for uh, not necessarily compensation, but little you know nicks and crannies, and they go shopping on some type of app or something. Is that still um, still taking place, or is that? even consider to like re-up people to, to recycle more? Um, I'm not familiar with that program. If we in fact had it in Connecticut, I know that Oregon uh, does that um, and it's uh, primarily for their um, redemptions uh, where someone can get a card and as much as you redeem, your card gets loaded and then you can you know, go to the grocery store um, etc. Or you can, there are other um, sort of incentives that you can use that for as well. For Connecticut, there may have been a program, but it may have been directed at municipalities. Uh, and so we may have funded municipalities to do something like that. Um, but I'm not familiar with a statewide program um, that, as you described it. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilman or Deputy Mayor, I saw your hand earlier. Gabrielle, uh, some towns have uh, already switched to the pay as you throw plan. And I'm wondering if you have any feedback as to, you know, which towns did it work or, you know, how many towns did it work at or how many municipalities, you know, had a big pushback by the residents and didn't really feel the program worked. And, and then as another question along the same lines, is there a big concern about the residents finding uh, inappropriate alternate places to throw their extra trash rather than pay for it? So I'm gonna answer your first question first. And that is in every town that implements it, it works. The only reason Connecticut municipalities back away is because of social media pressure. Um, and quite often there'll be one person with a rallying cry to others um, and, and they, they, um, they sort of coalesce into an action uh, committee in, in, uh, to oppose unit-based pricing or pay as you throw. Um, unfortunately, as I said earlier, a lot of times it's simply political pressure um, that is, is brought to bear um, to make the town back away from unit-based pricing. But every municipality that has tried it has seen significant reductions in the volume of MSW bound for disposal. Um, Stonington is currently active. There's, I think, three. Mansfield is doing it. Um, it there's, um, there are some municipalities that say, well, we're already doing it because of the pricing on the, on the, the carts. But that pricing is not linear, and that's the problem. So you pay for for hahas. Let's just say fifty dollars a month for one sized cart. Um, let's say it's a a, a a thirty six gallon, thirty yeah thirty six gallon tote. You pay fifty dollars a month for that uh, tote. 
but if you go to the next side, size up a 64 gallon tote, you're only paying another $10. So you're, you know, you're, you've got a huge uh, um, increase in terms of the volume of waste that that tote can accommodate, but a nominal extra charge. Um, and the base charges, the charges for collection, if you're a subscription town, the charges for collection and disposal, not disposal, sorry, collection and transportation are fixed. So someone who lives in a two bedroom home and has subscription service and someone who has a five bedroom home with, you know, many family members in that home are, are gonna be paying the same for the collection and the transportation the only difference is the size of their tote. Um, for a self haul municipality, so and some municipalities are both. And I actually, I'm, I apologize, I don't know specifically what Weathersfield is, um, but in my, I'm going to take my town. You could do subscription, and it's you know as I described, uh, or you can do self haul. Well, we do self haul, so we'll take the trash to the transfer station. Um, and we'll put the recycling into the recycling uh, containers. Um, so I'm, I'm paying based on the square footage of my home and someone else that has the same square footage is paying the same amount, whether they're generating a, a lot less than, than I am or a lot more than I am. Uh, and so making it so that it's a, a you pay commensurate with what you're generating makes it equitable. Um, so that the, the little widow that lives in a three bedroom house uh, isn't paying the same as the family of five, um, you know, who, you know, who's very gregarious and, and all the other kids from the neighborhood come over all the time. So they're generating a whole lot more trash than the little widow that's down, uh, and I'm saying this because there's a widow down at the corner, um, and she, you know she's paying the same if her square footage is the same as their uh, the other uh, resident's square footage, um, which just isn't fair. She's on a fixed income; they're not necessarily. Um, but that's that's one of the questions that comes up uh, is that equity of it. Um, the other question that comes up a great deal is the illegal dumping concern. And the reports that, and we're talking about hundreds, thousands of communities across the, the globe, um, but specifically here in the US, no reports of increased dumping, none. What you see is if there's already illegal dumping in a municipality, it just continues because it's not the people who are concerned about having to pay the $1.50 for the trash bag. Um, it's the people who just, just don't wanna pay. They don't wanna have subscription and they don't wanna to have to go to the transfer station and pay a fee if they have to pay a fee to get a sticker or whatever. They're, they're going to do the wrong thing no matter what your construct is. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Councilman Hill, you had a question earlier. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Gabrielle. Thank you for that. It's really helpful kind of walking us through that. Um, you brought up um, you know, a very good point in regards of you know, social media pre pressure mm -hmm. and political pressure is, is, is an impediment. And that's because I think, you know, it's you're, you're making a change. People have to change yes. their behavior and not everybody likes obviously to change their behavior, yeah. like to, to do things the way they like to do things. So, and, and I know each each home is different. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to, to determine this. So I would ask you a very kind of almost an impossible question, but what is what is that, what does that change look like to the average resident or taxpayer of a town like Weathersfield? What does my house or your house have to do? What changes do we have to make uh, in order for this to work? Like what, what if, what actually does it, you know, what kind of changes do I need to make in my house if we went, if we went through this, what would it look like? Do you, do you purchase a garbage bag now? Mm -hmm. Do you use garbage bags? Yep. You'd be buying garbage bags that are color coded or, um, uh, or uh, uh, bar coded um, 
that's specific to Weathersfield. So you would be paying for the disposal through the cost of the bag. And the bag cost is dif differentiated depending on the gallon uh, size of the bag. So some municipalities have two sizes, some municipalities have three sizes. Um, and so the cost per bag uh, covers the cost of disposal of the material that's in that bag. So if, if a municipality has waste management costs, and I think almost every municipality, there's only a handful of municipalities that do not have transfer stations. So just about every municipality in Connecticut has a transfer station and therefore has waste management costs. Um, so going to a unit-based pricing um, and supporting um, extended producer responsibility could significantly cut the costs for the municipality current state because recycling costs right now. Um, so if that cost were shifted from the municipality to the producer of the material that's going to be recycled, uh, that's going for recycling, um, then that's an eliminated cost right there. Uh, if you go to unit-based pricing, um, you're going to have perhaps um, less material at the transfer station, less frequent pickups, uh, that dynamic changes. What would you have to do? You'd have to purchase the bag uh, at the appropriate outlet. Some municipalities uh, will sell it at the, uh, at, you know, at local uh, grocery stores, at the town hall, at the public works, you know, they'll, they're available, they make them available so that it's a convenient um, uh, um, option. Um, and the resident pays for, you know, a pack of 10 bags or a pack of however many bags. Um, and then that's, that's the cost right there. That's the cost for disposal. Um, the, if you're a subscription uh, and you implement a bag a based program, you're still renting the cart and you're still paying for collection and transport, but you're no longer paying for disposal because that cost is in the bag. So um, the haulers then just charge for collection and transportation. And if the, the barrels were purchased by the municipality and provided to the resident, the resident isn't paying that either. Did that answer your question? It did. It th thank you. It's just again, like when it, when it, anytime we institute any thing like you know, this is a, a large, somewhat complex initiative, and so I think it's helpful to just kind of hear what the actual change is that it would have yeah. to be made. There's one other thing, so and that is, and that is, um, we've done uh, cost analyses. and um, the average consumer would save about twenty dollars a year. Um, buying subscription bags versus buying, um, you know, store store brand or, or national brand bags and using those for trash. So, so uh, and over the course of a year, um, people's cost for providing their for their bags um, may actually go down. Thank you. Interesting, Councilman O'Connor. Yes, uh, just a question: What does a bag cost? Um, so if you get, if you have like a, a variety of three bags, um, the smallest bag of 15 gallon, it, it all depends on it. There's a formula, uh, but, um, the, our, con the consultant that we, uh, have retained in order to inform municipalities about how it would work in their municipality will do an actual cost assessment. Uh, for the municipality. And, and I'm going to give you ranges. I'm not going to give you exact numbers. So if, if you have three different size bags, so you've got a, say, a, a, a 15 gallon, or let's say an eight gallon, a 15 gallon, and a 30 gallon. So the eight gallon may cost 75 cents a bag. Um, the 15 gallon may cost $1.15 a bag, and the 30 gallon would cost maybe, a, um, you know, 150, 180, something like that. Um, but 
but that cost covers the disposal. It doesn't sound like it does, but it really does. It, it covers the disposal cost for the volume of waste that's in that bag. So, uh, so just so I follow, so the, the, the theory behind this is our town cost for garbage disposal should go down because we're passing that burden on to the employer, to the resident. You're, you're, um, yes, you're, you're making the resident responsible for that. That would mean that either you have a choice at that point. You either reduce your mill rate, commensurate with what you're saving, or you use the money. You don't change the mill rate, and you use that money for other services. How much, on average, does the mill rate go down in your experience? In general experience, my understanding is municipalities don't drop the mill rate. They all have needs. They all have needs for additional revenue, for road repair, for you know infrastructure repairs. Um, you know, there's always costs for municipalities. I, you know, I'm not going to be disingenuous. You'll find a way to spend the money. So this, so in essence, it doesn't really save any money at all. It just gives a municipality another way to spend more. It 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 increases the the um, quality of life for the municipality because you have additional revenue to spend on repairs, refurbishment, maybe building a senior center, um, maybe providing uh, you know a, a a fund to the to the town library, um, you know needed costs for. Um, you know, education, all that kind of stuff. So you're improving the quality of life of the, the municipality in general. Um, it's just hard to pinpoint what municipalities do with that extra money. Um, but municipalities always have a need for that money. Um, and if there isn't a need, it goes into the rainy day fund for when you may have a catastrophic that, need. And, th and that I understand. By the way, I'm not arguing against this. I'm just trying yeah. to understand it. But um, municipalities have done that. They've taken, if they don't have anything to spend it on, they'll take it and they'll put it in the rainy day fund. And then when, you know, something happens and you've got to buy a new fire engine, a new fire truck, you know, that's $250,000 or a million dollars or however much they are. I haven't been shopping for fire trucks. Um, then you've got that rainy day fund that can either defray the cost or actually cover the cost. Right. No, and, and that I understand, I guess, but that the question I'm trying to figure out is, so are you thinking we're going to be saving millions of dollars because the thought of we could build a community center by doing this, I think that's kind of a lot of, that's a fairly large savings. And that's what I'm trying to say is how much money are we going to really save that we can put in a rainy day fund? So if I, if I go back to the slide that I showed you, if, if you're a tier one um, Mira town with a long-term commitment, uh, mm -hmm. then you're spent, you're going to be spending as of July 1, $105 per ton for disposal. If you reduced the volume of material for disposal by 6,000 tons in a year, you will realize approximately $574,000 in savings in, in one year. Okay. Is that realistic though? Yes. Is that pretty much average? Everyone who's ever introduced this, they're, they're dropping by 6,000 pounds? 44%. Okay. So if you're generating, if you're generating 100,000 tons, you're dropping by approximately 44,000 tons. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Mr. Deputy Mayor, did you have a follow-up question? Or? Yeah, actually, uh, <clears throat> that follow-up has been answered, but I have a, a separate unrelated question, if I may. So, uh, Gabrielle, in our town, we've been discussing uh, trying to get yard waste out of our trash stream. And I noticed that wasn't even one of the items on your list of uh, what all the towns were talking about. Or it's, I missed. Yeah, it's under it's under the catch-all organics. 
So it didn't seem like a big uh, contributor, but we, some of us have a feeling that it, it could be substantial. We tend to put a lot of, uh, uh, you know, grass and branches and pine needles and stuff in our regular trash can. And uh, we're trying to come up with a solution for that and whether it would be a, maybe a first start at trying to reduce our, our uh, trash disposal. Yep, that, that would be a great start. Have you seen municipalities uh, implement any of that organic uh, set aside? I know we have a transfer station and, and yeah. residents can drive down with barrels and truck fulls, um, but um, you know, for a specific set aside um, where they take it out of the, you know, the mainstream garbage disposal and um, have a separate pickup for that. Are there you know, municipalities around Wethersfield that are doing this? I'm not, I'm not sure um, what the status is of municipalities around, um, around your town, around Wethersfield, but um, so um, there, are, there is a law um, it's uh, General Connecticut General Statutes uh, 22A 241B, uh, and it's uh, regulations designating <coughs> items required to be recycled. Okay. And I just want to pull out the reg. Oh, it's great working from home. <laughs> Got all my stuff. Um, so the items that are required uh, to be recycled are um, leaves, uh, grass clippings, um, that's in a different section. So yard waste, yard trimmings should be recycled now. Um, and so if, if someone's putting it in the trash, then um, one, they're, they're they're wasting an organic resource um, that can be turned uh, in, uh, into something that benefits the soil, uh, obviously through composting. So um, pulling out yard waste or making, uh, making arrangements for yard waste not to be put into the MSW waste stream is, is a huge first step and a great, uh, a great first step uh, to take. Um, so you know, and we do that here. Yeah, providing, yeah, providing uh, convenient and accessible uh, disposal options, whether that's in the paper bags on the curb, um, you know, with respect to leaves and grass clippings, or if it's drop off at the transfer station. Um, yeah, any or all of those things can get implemented um, as needed. But my understanding was, at least from an email that I saw, um, was someone maybe contemplating a third barrel um, and where I, it wasn't clear to me that that third barrel would be only for yard waste um, or would that also be for food waste? Yard waste. Just yard waste. Just yard waste. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, I don't know what the situation would be for the for the cart. Are are they given to residents, or do residents pay for them? Um, does the municipality sell them to the residents? Right now, the discussion has been just uh, as a, a pilot program that I believe the hauler would provide, okay. um, and and see if you know if there is a drop in our tipping, you know. The, the weight and tipping fees. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, what is the likelihood of residents to take advantage mm -hmm. of that? You well, know? you know, you know that that's going to be seasonal, right? Because there's going to be a lot of yard waste in the spring and the fall. Not that uh, some during the summer and like 
very little during the winter. So it, there'll be a seasonal effect um, that you'll be seeing. So you don't want to you don't want to necessarily do a pilot during the winter. Um, and you don't necessarily want to do a pilot during the spring because that would skew your results and your projections. Um, so if you wanted to do a pilot, you would you would ideally want to do a 12 month pilot uh, and get that average cost. Um, you know, the savings uh, uh, for NSW uh, disposal it, without the yard waste um, being included in that barrel. Okay. Anybody else with any? Oh, uh, Councilman Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Gabrielle. Thanks for coming on. I want to follow up a little bit on those, the, those other questions. I, I was contemplating uh, other barrel or barrels, let's say, of different colors, right? You might imagine a, a brown barrel mm -hmm. for organics. Mm -hmm. First question is, do you, could you have all organics? Like grass is the same as food is the same as the other thing. And it's all mulled together into, you know, an organic mulch. Is that it, possible, or do we not? You wouldn't want to do that from a waste stream perspective. It it is possible, but it depends on the facility where the material is going to be processed. So some technology can take the the density of fibrous material, so like the yard trimmings and the branches and the twigs and the pine needles and all that. Uh, because their technology can accommodate that type of material. Other uh, facilities, um, and I'm going to use the one that we have in Southington, uh, the quantum facility can't take that kind of fibrous organic matter. Um, what they're looking for is food scrap. Um, they're looking for something that can, can be uh, um, made into a slurry, is easily pumpable, uh, and is readily available for digestion. The more fibrous stuff takes a lot longer to um, to break down. So if you have a different technology like dry technology, uh, so there's wet technology and dry technology and there's a whole bunch of different technologies under the wet technology. But if you use dry technology, yes, you, you want um, carbon content. You want that fibrous material in the process. Is there a facility in Connecticut that has both of them? As we just, you know, to no. have one waste stream for all that? No. How about across the country? Is it somewhere else across the country solve this issue? Is it in a single barrel? Uh, no. Uh, no. If you're going to, um, if you're going to initiate a food scrap diversion program, you, your, your, I think your biggest bang for the buck is to do a separate bag, a separate color coded bag for organics and have that placed in the same container as your MSW. Those can get separated uh, at the point of uh, being delivered to a, a tipping floor. They can get separated. The MSW can go in one direction and the organics, the food waste can go in the other direction. So we currently have a program in the fall usually where we take all of our leaves and twigs and grass clippings or whatever, put them inside the street, a big my kids call us snuffle up, I guess, and I guess I do too. Uh, you know, comes around, picks them up, and then I think in the spring, that somewhere down the town transfer station, they mull it all together, and we can all you know go down there for free and sort of pick up all of our stuff. Yes. Is is there a way to have has a town taken that concept and said, you know, okay, we'll just put it in the barrels. We're going to have it be more often, and we're going to get this out of the stream instead of the one time that we do it at the end of the year. So many municipalities have leaf composting operations. And I think that's what you're describing um, is a leaf composting operation. And, um, and that's, the, that's a great way to compost the yard waste. Uh, so if you have chipped yard waste, um, because you wanna increase the surface area for accessibility for decomposition, um, you have your chipped yard waste, put it in with your leaves, and your grass clippings, and you'll have wonderful mulch, mulch um, you know, or compost or soil amendment, whatever you, you know, however you want to use it, um, you know, in four to six months. And that's why, that's what your municipality does. Um, it composts its leaves. Yeah, I understand that. And, and now what I'm talking about is how do we extend that throughout a, a majority of the year when people are still creating all this waste that's not that last week in the fall, you know, that last couple of weeks in the fall, so we can get it out of the waste stream. 
have municipalities either within or without the state done done a program where now it's consistent to get all that yard waste out? I'm sure there are. I can't give you um, a, a municipality off the top of my head, but I can definitely ask. So what municipalities yeah, are- And created a, you know, a, a, comp, a regular composting yeah. stream for, the, for their town to get it out of the waste. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's numerous towns that are doing um, leaf composting. Uh, it's harder to do necessarily in the winter because of the temperatures and because of the feedstock, obviously. Um, so there has to be some seasonality to it. Um, I don't know that uh, any municipality can do it 12 months out of the year, um, but I'm pretty sure that there are municipalities that do it more than once a year. I'm, I, I think I can put money on that, that there are municipalities that do more than once a year, yeah. um, you I'm, know, I'm aggregation. Thinking regular, I'm thinking of a regular yeah. program because people mow their lawns at all times of the year and throughout most of the year, along with branches coming down before and after the storm, it doesn't even matter, right? It's a regular stream of waste. And I understand that January may not be a hot yeah. time, but to create mm -hmm. a program mm -hmm. that can take it out and we can efficiently handle it and we have mm -hmm. seems to be other resources to do it now. Yeah. It may not be that we have our town staff doing it on a regular basis, but maybe other towns have used, you know, they're actually collection bins now and it's done through the regular trash stream. We don't have a snuffle of it gets going up and down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every other week throughout the you yeah. know, 10 months of the year. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know how they they done that. So that would be interesting yeah. to find out. I will I will get back to you. Uh, with next, that information. The next thing is I didn't really follow uh, the bag situation. There's, I think Councillor Hill brought up a very interesting question is what does it really look like? Mm -hmm. And we have, we've got big, we call them trash cans. I don't know if they're technically called the tote technically mm -hmm. or what, but we've got these sort of giant trash cans and it wasn't clear to me. I thought I followed you. Like I could have a large trash can versus my neighbor would have a small trash can and I can maybe do a subscription service and say, you know, I pay $600 a year for a large, each large trash can I have and that's it. But my under, my thought process was that you, if it's pay per use, you pay like maybe by weight. So when they would pick it up, but then you're telling me about like bags that are coated, but we don't use bags here necessarily, or maybe we would. And so I'm not quite understanding, do I throw five bags? Is it now, do, I, do we not have these, you know, plastic containers with wheels anymore? Are they gone by the wayside? Is it done by weight? Is it done by bag? Can you help me understand the difference there? Yeah, yeah. there's different programs that can get implemented. Um, so you can, do, you can do based on cart and that's a volume based because most uh, haulers do not have the, um, the technology for weighing a, a cart or a tote or a barrel um, at pickup. So, um, so they, they're pricing per volume. So uh, a 96 gallon tote versus a 64 gallon, gallon tote has a, a price differential, but it's not linear with the volume. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're, you're not paying you know, a third more for your 96 gallon tote versus your 64 gallon tote. You're paying a nominal amount more. It's that well, for 25 more cents, you can get the extra large soda or the extra large popcorn um, rather than getting the large, get the extra large, it's only yeah. a quarter. So but if you they, if you did it linear, but you could charge it, even though you have these big plastic trash cans with the wheels on the bottom, you could charge it linearly. linearly absolutely. And, and it would still yes. have, it would have the desired effect yes. as, you're, as you're describing. Yes, it would. But haulers don't like to do that. Haulers like to provide an incentive for um, making the client, their customer pay, you know, the most because it looks like a bargain. Um, but the price driver is making it linear. The carts don't have to go anywhere. If they're already owned, um, then, you know, they're already owned. If they're rented, <laughs> they can get shifted out for a different sized cart but the, the price signal is what you're looking for. So it doesn't matter if you do it based on a cart, as long as it's linear or a bag, um, because that's going to be linear or approximately linear uh, as well. 
do you could you provide the towns that do do it and a and have a cart situation like we do, I guess, trash can cart, and also do it linearly? What I can do is actually tell uh, tell you that I will get Kristen Brown, who is the contractor who's worked with municipalities across the country, uh, many municipalities in Massachusetts, and she's um, worked with many municipalities here in Connecticut as well. Uh, and she can actually um, like map out the costs associated um, and like, what would the cost be for different size bags for Weathersfield? Um, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, tote or cart based pricing systems work and don't work? Um, so she's got a wealth of experience uh, and can and can provide that information to you. Um, now you also I, okay. Thank you. you yeah. Okay. Now you, you also had a list of items that people have banned, sort of like the styrofoam styrofoam pieces and a couple other technical polymers, I think. Um, is there a cost increase associated when you put something like that in place? The disposal ban? Yes. No, because these are legislative mandates. So um, legislature says Connecticut doesn't want PFAS containing foodware ever anymore. So don't even buy it, don't even use it, don't bring it into the into the state. Um, polystyrene, um, I mean, I get, uh, you know, if I order something, I'll get, uh, I sometimes get polystyrene, <clears throat> in which case it has to go in the trash. It doesn't weigh a lot, but it just, it's bulky. Um, so but there's not a statewide ban on that. No, there isn't, but, but you there's legislation. You municipalities that did have a ban on that. Um, you can you can implement a ban on polystyrene, um, and so then you had a graph where I think five or six towns. Yep, had there a were yep yeah, they were they were suggestions uh, that uh, municipalities had an interest in or may take action to uh, issue you know pass an ordinance that bans polystyrene. Um, so for, for those that did do that, was there an increased cost? Let's say you know it was used in your school system to deliver lunches something like that. Yeah, I don't know. I think there, I think that there was a cost associated with, well, now what do we do with them? And you, we've expended the money on the polystyrene trays for, for kids lunches. Um, so now what do we do with them? So I think that that was a, a sticking point for some municipalities. Um, but I don't, I don't, I wasn't, I'm not intimate into in the details of uh, what transpired and how they were able to get rid of that material. Um, or if the ban even helped. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Councilman Peltier. Hi, I just wanted to circle back to um, something that was brought up a little while ago about um, illegal dumping and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And you mentioned that it, it doesn't increase if towns already we're doing it, it, they continue to do it. Is there data for that? Or is that being monitored? Yeah. Like, so, because I I have some concerns about pay as you go or pay as you throw. Mm -hmm. um, I have some relatives who lived in a town in Massachusetts that did this and they use bag tags. And there was, uh, you know, there was be the issue of, I ran out of the bag tags and I can't, you know, I can't, you know, to put out my trash and the trash, you know, when you're trying to get to the stores that sell them and, and it was just always this sort of extra burden on the um, residents and they hated it. Um, and they said they would see people just throwing trash, like, in, you know, in their backyards or, you know, in public places. Now, who knows, you know, they didn't live there that long. So I don't know how it was before they implemented the, the program, but, um, and I, but I just, because of that, their experience, it's always sort of stuck in my mind that this would be um, I, just the, the burden it puts on residents. And then also I would think it might have a disproportional impact on lower income residents who need to, you know, buy these bags and, it's, you know, since it's sort of like a flat, flat cost, um, it's, it would be like, 
you know, a little, it's a little regressive, but, um, but I just think it, maybe it's just the, the time period it takes getting used to, but, um, I do have like some concerns about going this route and I can't imagine it wouldn't have any impact, um, on, you know, people throwing out their trash elsewhere and maybe a, a dumpster behind a building or something, even if it's not throwing it on the street or, you know, in a park, but, um, I just wanted to so throw that out there. I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, but, but that is interesting that you actually have data. How do you monitor how, you know, like currently, how many, how much illegal dumping is going on like here in Weathersfield, for example? I don't, I, I don't have that kind of statistic and the department does not monitor that. Um, the reporting that we have is based on um, waste zeros experiences uh, and other municipalities across the country implementing pay as you throw programs. Um, and where there was illegal dumping, it didn't change. There was still illegal dumping. Um, there's still bad actors no matter where you go. There's still going to be people who don't want to participate, you know, don't want to make the additional effort if an additional effort is even warranted. Um, but so you can't change human nature in that regard. Uh, but the reports are no increase in illegal dumping. Um, there may be anecdotally, you know, one offs, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, my neighbor heard about this. So that must be what's going on all over the place. You, you, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting accurate information and not basing our reactions on an anecdote, like a one-off. Um, so yes, there are people who throw their uh, trash in any open dumpster. We see it all the time. Um, that doesn't mean that it will uh, increase in terms of frequency. To address your concern regarding um, uh, you know, uh, residents that are economically uh, challenged, um, we can, uh, there are uh, municipalities that have implemented these programs and with a grant or uh, taking the savings that the municipality realizes in terms of waste management costs um, and providing free bags for those that are uh, at a, a certain uh, poverty, uh, below a certain poverty level, um, uh, or seniors, you know, providing a free bag per week for seniors. Um, and th I mean, there are different implementation methods. So you can say we're starting it on July 1 and you get 26 free bags for this year. And then after that, you have to buy them or you get 52 bags this year. Uh, and then after that, no free bags and you're just, you just, you need to buy them. Um, there's just different ways of implementing it. You can provide subsidies, you know, um, for as long as you want to provide subsidies um, for some sectors of the population uh, versus other sectors. Um, but there's, but those types of concerns uh, can be addressed um, and, and, uh, and do and do it in an equitable manner as well. Okay. Anything else? No, these were all very interesting ideas, and you know, some definitely some things that we both have. Uh, Gary Evans, town manager, and Sally Katz, our physical services director, uh, on as well. So. Um, yeah, I'm sure they've been taking copious notes to see what um, what plans we might be able to implement. One thing that uh, I had um, been approached in the past about was the quantum facility mm -hmm. in Southington and uh, the ability to you know look at schools and this just you know even if it's just a, like you know we keep kicking around the idea of a pilot program, but with schools and the food scrap waste um, mm -hmm. delivered down to now would quantum be the only facility in Connecticut that right now takes a slurry mix or are there other food waste 
food waste? Um, no, um, there are, are other facilities and we on our web page, um, if you uh, if you search for uh, composting or food waste, uh, you'll you should be directed to a page that lists the facilities and what material the composting facilities and what materials they take. Um, keeping in mind that we we consider anaerobic digestion composting as well mm -hmm. because there's two different types. There's aerobic and anaerobic. And so the ones that are open air that are windrows uh, like leaf composting, that's aerobic. Um, and the one and the Southington one uh, in vessel is anaerobic. Um, so um, we have a list that, sh that indicates which types of facilities take what type of material. So okay. Southington is not the only one, um, but there may only be one or two others. Um, there's another one in Thompson that uh, just received its permit um, last week, uh, and it's on farm AD, um, but they're receiving food waste uh, from a food manufacturing process, like a dairy processing mm -hmm. um, facility. So they're getting that material from that uh, generator. Right. And it's, um, it, it can be a generator too. Uh, oh yeah. Renewable or re, um, I guess it would be a renewable trash to energy, um, creates fuel and they operate, um, power generation from it. So you mean the anaerobic digesters? The anaerobic. Yes. 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 So, um, the way we look at it and the way we met, we made it uh, so that it, it didn't have to go through as rigorous a process as waste to energy facilities, because the goal is uh, to beneficially use the end products uh, and the end products, namely the digestate, the solids and the liquid fraction of the material that gets processed through the digester. Um, we looked at it as a composting facility as opposed to a waste to energy facility. One of the uh, happy byproduct is that they can generate electricity. Um, and so it, it, it but we, it, for, for permitting purposes and for, um, you know, enhancing uh, the goals of the uh, statewide solid waste management plan, looked at these facilities as composting facilities and required beneficial uses of the end products, um, the solids and the liquids, uh, or at least one of them, depending on the facility. So, um, yeah, they they do generate electricity. They can establish microgrids. So if it's located near a school, for example, um, or a town um, building, uh, you can establish a microgrid so that in the event of um, a natural disaster, you can still have like warming or cooling centers, um, places where people can charge their, their phones. Uh, take showers, etc. So that it, even if the, you know, the, the town is off uh, power, you you still have the ability to power, you know, a, a localized area. Through a microgrid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and Southington uh, school system pre COVID um, was uh, I think diverting their food scraps from the school cafeterias to Southington. So yeah, there's a huge opportunity. Uh, schools are not required to divert. Schools are not one of the commercial sectors um, that, are, that are identified in um, 22A, uh, 226E as being required to divert if there's a composting, uh, an anaerobic digestion facility or processing facility within 20 miles. Um, but there, I mean, that's, that's feedstock rich. <laughs> mm -hmm. School cafeterias is feedstock rich. Gotcha. Okay. Very informative. Um, thank you for uh, presenting tonight. Uh, I mean, much more than, you know, what I had envisioned and uh, definitely opened up our eyes, at least my eyes to uh, some possibilities out there. So not only to reduce what Mira is taking from us, thus reduce, you know, that inevitable June 2022 date and, uh, you know, what we would be doing. And then also with the idea to, you know, save residents um, tax dollars 
and divert mm -hmm. it possibly to um, you know other services here in town. But also, also to create a more sustainable society as well. Yeah, I mean, right. every cool. every every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. yeah. so it definitely. was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Gary has my contact information. Um, so individually, if you have questions, feel free to reach out and I can, if I don't know the answer, I can put you in touch with an expert that does. Great. No, sounds Thank like you were, were very knowledgeable. So we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You too. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Very informative. Um, you know, these are some of the discussions that uh, you know, I, along with a couple other folks, have had with um, both Gary and Sally over the last couple of months. That uh, maybe we'll see some fruition from it, um, but no pun intended. Lots to digest from that. So <coughs> we'll get around to it. Um, going forward, um, yes, it's my honor uh, to. I think I did this last year and um, I kind of have a, an idea this year, uh, having watched uh, the NASA space landing just uh, about a week or two ago, um, Dr. Swati Mohan, if, uh, if anybody had watched it, was the um, voice behind the Mars rover landing, Perseverance. And uh, um, I thought it was appropriate watching uh, that with my kids to, uh, uh, mention her tonight when uh, I present this proclamation on behalf of uh, Women's History Month here in uh, not only you know, Weathersfield, but uh, nationally we celebrate uh, women this year or this month um, and in particular you know, the, the struggles that uh, um, they've overcome and continue to overcome. Uh, with that, there is a proclamation celebrating women's history. And if you don't mind my indulgence, um, I don't know if Gary has the proclamation to present up or if just I have it to, to read, I'll be happy to do it. If um, <clears throat> it's not on the official paper, so it's probably best if you read it, but if you wait a few seconds, I can also get it up on the uh, screen. of working IT virtually. Well, I could go right ahead. Yep, or I could do, yeah, either one. Well, so you can't see it, but they can. There we go. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was up on the regular screen, but. Well, I'll be happy to uh, present this Women's History Month proclamation on behalf of the town of Wethersfield. Uh, whereas women of every race, class, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, and abilities have made historic contributions to the strength of our town, our state, and our nation in countless recorded and unrecorded ways. And whereas in overcoming discrimination, harassment, and hardship, women have been bold and fearless, never giving up on the promise that with hard work and determination, nothing is out of reach. And whereas American women have been leaders, not only in securing their own rights of suffrage and equal opportunity, but also in the abolishment movement, the emancipation movement, the industrial labor movement, the civil rights movement, and other movements, especially the peace movement, which created a more fair and just society for all. And whereas despite the count the contributions, the role of American women in our history has been overlooked and undervalued in both literature and the study of American history. And whereas we honor women by remembering the trailblazers of the past and present, 
by carrying forward their valuable lessons learned from the powerful examples they set. Whether teaching our children, caring for our sick, serving in our wars, starting businesses, serving in elected positions, or venturing into unknown frontiers, generations of women believed their gender was no obstacle to what they could achieve. And whereas during Women's History Month, we recognize the advances have been made, but acknowledge that more work needs to be done so women can gain gender equality, access, and inclusivity in Wethersfield and beyond. Now, therefore, be it resolved, as mayor, I join with the Wethersfield Town Council in proclaiming this month, month uh, the month of March 21st, March 2021, Women's History Month in the town of Wethersfield and encourage all residents to honor, recognize, and celebrate the many contributions made by women as we join in this observance. In witness thereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the town of Wethersfield, Connecticut to be fixed this first day of March, 2021. Thank you for letting me do that. I appreciate um, as a uh, husband to a wife who is a nurse and family who are teachers and um, trailblazers themselves teaching our young and uh, helping our um, most vulnerable um, you know not only is March you know a proud proud month for uh, for us it should be a um, you know a year-round um, celebration to endeavors and, and work that uh, women have done to build our society to what it is today so thank you Uh, going forward on the comments, I believe we have some public comment. Um, just for the record, uh, we are going to uh, still hold by the five minute mark. Uh, there has been some difficulty in the past with uh, the ability to hear uh, the timer go off just because with it being virtually, uh, many people don't hear it. They have their computers or TVs turned down because of uh, the echoing effect of having uh, two devices going at the same time. Uh, hopefully we'll get back into a public meeting at some point soon. Uh, but for right now, um, please indulge us as we try to keep within the five minute mark. Uh, I will you know, obviously stop people if they continue to go over. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the last meeting, um, please um, make sure Etiquette is followed and, um, you know, be respectful to not only those who are speaking, uh, but to those who are present on this Zoom uh, as well, listening in. And do we have anybody? Gary? Yep. Queued up? Um, and I apologize. This is a little um, clunky as I'm trying out the new system with the clock here. So uh, first caller I saw was 860-563. 6923. If you can identify yourself by giving your name and address, um, please press star six if you need to unmute yourself. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, that discussion that you just had regarding uh, waste, that was, um, as, as someone had mentioned, uh, we've heard some of this before, but some of this, some of this, I, you know, was new. Uh, to know how much trash we're really uh, paying for to be hauled away and taken care of. But uh, I, I do have some exceptions that I'd like to talk about regarding it. And uh, one is it was mentioned that uh, uh, smoke detectors, batteries, tires, gas cylinders uh, are, have been a problem. Yet we have MDC that takes our batteries once a year under hazardous waste. They also take the smoke detectors. Uh, I don't know about gas. I don't know what the young lady meant by gas cylinders, but tires really, I don't know how that comes up because none of us tear off our tires and put new tires on. You know, we go to the town fair tire and we, and we, they tear them off. They put new ones on and they dispose of, you know, our, our older ones. So I, I really have a, I just don't understand why tires are such a problem. Um, uh, Gabrielle was talking about food waste. Um, you know, I I throw everything in my garden. I throw coffee grinds, 
along with my roses and different kinds of plants. And and maybe maybe what we need to do is to eliminate some of this stuff from the from the garbage stream. Maybe educate people to put in gardens. Use it use use their banana peels and use their orange peels and their apples and that they're throwing away. Uh, the squash, there's all kinds of things that could go out into their gardens, and uh, and they could become uh, uh, organic. I'm or, I have organic gardens only because I use this other stuff. I really don't care in the least one way or another what I have, but I do use it, and it doesn't go into the rubbish. Um, and you know, it was mentioned also grass clippings. Grass, I use all of my grass clippings to put around my tomato plants and my, my cucumbers and my all these other kind of plants that I put in. Uh, I utilize all of that in, to my, in my garden. Maybe, maybe Weathersfield should get on the bandwagon instead of uh, selling bags to people so or thinking they might be able to save some money that way. Try to educate people to do gardening. And, and use different kinds of refuge in different parts of their property for enhancements instead of buying fertilizer. I wish I could use it to put on my lawn, but I can't. Um, so that was just a couple little things that I, I wanted to mention tonight. Uh, next, <clears throat> I noticed in the, in the Hartford Current, I think it was the... Um, uh, February 11th, 2001, they had the grand list, or I should say the municipality aid uh, by town. And I noticed where uh, Weathersfield, uh, it looks like for the year 2021, we're going to be getting $11 million to uh, $800,000 from the state of Connecticut. But what I also notice is our next door neighbor over in Newington, uh, they're getting the same time span they're, they're picking up $17,900 from the state of Connecticut. Uh, that, that's like a $6 million increase for them. And uh, and, and th the question is, why, why are they getting that and we're not? You know, and I went back and I looked at their population. Their population is 30,000 people. Ours is 26,000 people. Their medium household is $80,000 a year. Ours is eighty three thousand um, dollars. You know the average homes are they're at two sixty eight. We're at two eighty six. You know there's a little differences here and there. The the land mass appears to be about the same thirteen point thirteen thirteen square miles roughly. But why in the world are they getting more six million dollars more than we do? Um, does uh, the state of Connecticut look upon them as uh, they're more in need, uh, and, and we're not more in need. What, what can this be? Uh, and I think our mill rates are pretty much about the same. I think Newington was uh, 39, mil, the mill rate, and ours is running at what 41. That's about the, that's about the same. The school system. I looked at that. Uh, there's 4,000 students. Oh my gosh! And it looks like we only have 3,500 students. So anyway, I just want to throw that at you, and maybe I'll talk at the next section. No, that's a very good point. And, and, and I think it's a good thing you put the, 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 the clock up there, because we do look at it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were concerned that you know viewers and callers wouldn't be able to hear the uh, um, timer go off if they have other uh, channels muted for the, uh, the Zoom. Thank you, Mr. Young. You make a very good point about the Newington and you know the, the return. Uh, we'll take a look at that and see uh, why the uh, discrepancy is there. Thank you. Anybody else, Gary? Not at this time, Mayor. Okay. Moving on the agenda, no discussion items. I think we have some council actions, uh, nothing for referral, but we do have uh, three appointments. I think Councilman Forrest has those appointments. 
Thanks, Mayor. One fell swoop, I'd like to appoint James Hurlbert for to 24 Mountain Laurel Drive to the Weathersfield Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities from 321 uh, 3121 to 63023. I'd like to appoint Frank Cena of 103 Eastern Drive from 3121 to 63023 to the Veterans Commission. And to fill the outstanding vacancy currently on that commission, I'd like to appoint Tricia Giscombe of 21 Stillman Road from a period of 3121 to 63022. And hopefully, I could get a second from one of my fellow. Uh, quite, uh, good question before we second that. Um, do you uh, know if the Trisha appointment is for an alternate position or is it for one of the primary positions? The, the, chair, the chair asked me this question, so I wanted to make sure. I don't, don't know on the top of my head, but I turned to Gary Evans for the technicalities of that. Um, Sorry, Gary, I just want to make sure because that's how Frank Cena lost his seat before. It wasn't um, uh, voted on properly, so I just want to make sure we do it the right way. Just going online to look at the commissions. It looks like there were two vacancies as regular members and then there is a that was it just the alternate it had been filled uh in december of 2020 by sandra rhodes was the alternate position so it looks yeah. like would be the two vacancies for the full members got it thank you very much yeah appreciate it. um I, i'll second Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of these appointments, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have. Thank you, Councilman Forrest. Continue on down to item, item number B3. This, and I think Mike O'Neill is on the phone with us or on the Zoom with us. The um, purchasing cards for town employees. Um, I think, uh, Mike, if you can give us a little bit of background on this, that, uh, you know, who in town, or not who in town staff currently has it, but we currently have the program for town staff and we're looking to um, change the vendor and bring it into a little bit more um, transparency and compliance with Munis, our Munis system, so that uh, um, it can be readily tracked by the finance department, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. This item would be uh, for your consideration as award of a, a contract with JP Morgan Chase Bank for a purchasing card services uh, program. JP Morgan currently has a contract with the state of Connecticut through the Department of Administrative Services. This would be a piggyback on that agreement. It would be um, all, the, all the same terms of that agreement. Uh, the state has made this program available to cities and towns, uh, boards of ed and uh, nonprofits. And there's a number of those um, currently 50 or more, I think that, uh, that take part in this program uh, would be a separate agreement between the town and uh, JP Morgan Chase Bank. Um, same exact terms that uh, the state has um, state uh, you know went through all the procurement steps to uh, when they created this program several years ago uh, we do have a program as the mayor mentioned now we have a kind of a limited purchasing card program with american express we have about uh, 10 or a dozen cards out mainly with uh, department heads and what this would allow us this would allow us to do a couple of things one is to expand that um, and to allow some other employees to use those cards um, because the program allows for uh, controls on each individual card. Um, so we can, we can give a card to an individual and limit, limit it to uh, just specific vendors, um, limit the, uh, the amount of transactions, the maximum amount of transactions or the number of transactions. Um, and it also 
allows us to sort of build our tax exempt status into the card so that we, uh, you know, that we do a good job of that now and making sure that uh, purchases um, are not subjected to sales tax. You know, this has got kind of an added feature to, uh, um, to have that authentication right in the card. Um, it also would integrate with our financial system, Munis, and it would allow us to just to really, and, and the thing that I like it for, in addition to, uh, you know, allowing some additional people to use the cards is uh, the streamlining of the, the payment process and just the, you know, the tracking of the transactions and getting those into the system. It'll, uh, it'll make that much more efficient for us. I appreciate that, Mike. Is there any questions for Mike on this? Councilman O'Connor. Uh, hey, Mike, I just had a question about the rewards and how that works. Is it, you know, a lot of these cards have the 1% buyback or payback or mileage and stuff like that. Does the town reap any of that? Uh, we would, you know, which again is, a, is something uh, that goes beyond what we have now. Um, it's it's a one percent, or it might be one point oh five percent over a certain amount. Um, I did check with a couple of other towns on that, and um, I think you know we'd probably see from ten to twenty thousand dollars, you know, once we got the program up and running um, annually. And that's something that the bank pays once a year. Right. So they would they obviously track our transactions, but they would um, they would make that payment to us um, at the end of the year. Cool. Good. Thank you. And no other cost, um, no cost to the program unless you know payment wasn't made and and fees were incurred because of that. But they also allow us to. Uh, you know, we could set up an automatic debit, which is, you know, is appealing to me, you know, just makes it easy to automatically make that payment, um, you know, at the normal time of the cycle each month. All right. Great. Thank you. Anybody else with any questions for Mike? I guess my question would be, as it, it would go through the finance department, but if Social services had a card, and they purchased, um, you know, food for the holidays or, or gift cards or or something like that with the the card. Does it come to you, and then it goes out of uh, social services uh, budget, or does it come out of general fund, or is there a way to uh, earmark where those funds are withdrawn from? It's yes, and actually, what it allows us to do is each department. Um, so, if I go out and make a purchase, come back to the office, I can go right onto the the portal at the bank and designate where the where that charge um, goes in Munis, you know, our, our account in Munis. So, by the time it reaches finance, um, we'll get a bundle of receipts. And then we can download the information from the bank and it's already configured with all of the, you know, where, where it's supposed to be charged, the programs, uh, various programs on the uh, general ledger, you know, when, and that's the piece where we're doing, you know, right now that comes to us manually and manually. You know, it's an email or it's, it's written in, you know, by hand on the back of the receipt or something. And we're, we're putting that information into Munis. So it decentralizes that a bit and, and just streamlines things. Great. Uh, I think it's a really good idea. Anybody else, any questions for Mike? Okay, and then if we need a motion with this, even despite the fact that there's no cost, Gary, um, because this is a, uh, a new contract. Right. Sure. Is there anyone with a motion for this item? Make a motion to award a contract for purchasing card services to the state of Connecticut and J.P. Morgan Chase Bank pursuant to the terms of state contract 16PSX0058 and to authorize the town manager to execute a contract for same with the state of Connecticut and J.P. Morgan Chase Bank National Association. Second. Great. 
motion on this has been made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe. It's Mike. Yes, thank you, Mike. We appreciate that. Now, no more uh, council action is the, I believe we have the minutes. If everybody takes a moment, just to take a look at the February, last meetings, February 16th minutes. If anybody had any questions, comments, corrections to those at all, uh, speak move, now. Move acceptance of the February 16th, 2021 regular minutes. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the minutes. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. And then now uh, final five minute public speaking. I think we have one on the call. Yep. So hold on one moment. Okay, 860-563-6923. Please state your name and address for the record. Star six to unmute yourself. Uh, good evening again, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I'd, I'd like to say a couple more things about the uh, discussion on waste. You know, it's been said more than once that a lot of yard waste ends up in the trash buckets. And, and you know, years ago, we used to burn that yard waste. And now the state of Connecticut, even the town, I don't know who it is that has the law, but you can't burn. You, you know, the government itself created this problem of having all this waste being taken away. We used to burn it. Years ago, we used to burn leaves. We used to burn branches. We used to burn a lot of things. And the government has, has, has implemented such rules or laws that today we have this waste problem. It's the problem created by our own government. That's why we have all this waste. And I just wanted to put that out on the table for you because um, I think it's very serious. Uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is, you know, Gabrielle had talked about equitable. Oh, it would be equitable to um, have, the, have the, the widow down the street, she only buys a small bag because she doesn't have a lot of stuff. And the guy down uh, further up the street, he's got six people in his house. He needs a bigger bag. So it becomes more equitable. And, you know, I, um, I think assist at that equitable thing sort of like resonates with me on the fact that there's services that I'm paying for in this town that I don't even use. And when I have to pay for something that I don't use, that's not equitable. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there screaming about they want equity. They want equitable stuff, you know? Yeah. If you're going to scream about that, you've got to scream about the people who are paying taxes for things that they're not using. And for instance, like I'm saying, in my case, the only thing I use is the highways and the, and the garbage disposal. Uh, what's their name that comes by and picks up the garbage? Uh, and I don't use much more in town. Uh, and, oh, I come and I bother you guys at your meeting. But the fact is, to me, you know, to, when we start talking about a group like that woman, uh, Gabrielle, talking about equitable, I think equitable, the word has, has to spread out across all sorts of areas of town to make things equitable. And, and I really think you should be equitable to people like myself and a lot of other retired people or people who are beyond ch childbearing that... We, we we should be eliminated from paying some of these costs that we have in town. Anyway, uh, next subject. 
Um, and, 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 hey, Mayor, I, I don't have you on my screen right now because I was searching for your emails because I wanted to send you something. And I did see on town council a whole bunch of names, all the council members, and it says click on them to see your email. And I did, and I couldn't find it. The email doesn't poke up. So maybe it's my machine, maybe it's your machine. But anyway, I want to push along. Um, I've been talking to you guys about uh, – we, we should be doing something profitable with the Keisha farm. Uh, just this week, I, I, I noted that in the town of Newington, and I was talking about Newington no more than 20 minutes ago to you folks, in the town of Newington, they have a little community called Newington Ridge Preserve. It's a 55-plus community. It's no more than three miles away from the Keisha farm. Uh, and I want to tell you, they have some very nice little homes in there. They're stand standalone homes for people 55 and over. Um, you know, they're anywhere from 2,500 square feet to 1,900 square feet that had sold recently. I know there's probably about 10 or 12 in there. But the fact is, these properties are paying like $10,000 a year property tax. And I really think that we should give this kind of a – I'm not saying this, these types of homes that are being built there should be on the Keisha farm, but something similar to them or maybe them. But the fact is if they're generating $10,000, one place is $10,900, another one was $9,000 some dollars, $9,600. And, and if you went right around the whole place – oh, boy. You'd, you'd be collecting a lot of taxes. I guess I'll have to continue talking next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Young. We appreciate that. Okay. Anybody else on the call? I see none there. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you. It's a very informative um, council meeting with uh, DEEP. Definitely some takeaways from that, and we'll have some ongoing conversations, um, see if we can generate something from it. Uh, anybody with any parting words or final words before we go? If not, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Well, uh, meetings adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good evening. Good night. All right, everyone.